Well, good morning and welcome to Christ United Reformed Church. It's good to be gathered together as the people of God and to be able to begin this week in his house, worshiping his name. Uh, just one announcement to draw your attention to. It's in the bulletin as well, but this will be our last Sunday with Reverend Cortez before he puts to sea as Chaplain Cortez. Uh, he's planning on being gone for, I think, a little over a month, so we wish you well. I think you're supposed to wish you what, fair winds and following seas. Um, and also uh, fit, fruitful ministry as you minister to the sailors aboard. So we'll be praying for you and praying for your family as you're gone. Uh, the Lord will sustain them. Our God calls us to worship this morning with these words from Psalm 96, verses 7 through 9. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Let us stand together that we might hear the blessing of our God. Dearly loved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth, and he greets us this morning with these words from the book of Second Peter. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's take up our psalters together and turn to number 30. O Lord, I will extol you. We'll sing all the verses together of number 30.
seated. We want to turn our attention now to the reading of God's law. The scriptures teach us that through the law comes the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. And the Apostle Paul testifies, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, Romans 7.7. 7. Thus the law shows us our sin and consequently our need of Christ. So let us read the law of God together as we find it in Deuteronomy chapter 5. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in, on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house his field, his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. And when our Lord was asked which is the most important commandment, he reminded us that the first and most important commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's the summary of the law, it shows us what God's will is for our lives, and it also demonstrates how many ways we have gotten these things wrong. Uh, we have failed to love God the way we should. The, the things that we should do, we find ourselves not doing. Things we should not do towards him, we find ourselves doing. And the same is true for our neighbor. Uh, we don't love our neighbor as we should. Uh, we don't do the things God has called us to, and there are many ways we fail to keep his law. And that's why we read the law, to remind us of God's goodwill for our lives, to set it before ourselves as a mirror that we might see in ourselves how far short we fall and that we might bring our failings and our sins to our God and find forgiveness in Christ's name. And so the reading of the law always then leads to our prayer for confession, confessing our sins and seeking refuge in God alone. We'll pray this prayer of confession that's printed in the bulletin. Uh, we'll pray this prayer out loud together, and then we'll leave time at the end for each one of us to confess silently his or her own sins. So let's pray this prayer together, not only with our lips, but from the heart. Let us pray. Merciful and gracious Father, to you belong righteousness, mercy, and forgiveness. But to us belongs open shame, for we are miserable sinners. We were brought forth in iniquity and conceived in sin, against you, you only, have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Our sins are always before us. We come before you with broken spirits, but we know that broken and contrite hearts you will not despise. Have mercy on us, O Father, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sins. Purge us with the spirit of Jesus and we shall be clean. Wash us with the blood of your son and we shall be whiter than snow. 
hide your face from our sins, and blot out all our iniquities. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Let us hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and uphold us with a willing spirit. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, we are called to confess our sins and called before our God that he might assure us by his word that we are forgiven of our sins if we call on his name. And so, dearly loved brothers and sisters, you've heard God's law. You've confessed your sins to our merciful Heavenly Father, and so the Holy Spirit assures us with these words from Galatians chapter 4, 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Therefore, God's word assures us that if you repent of your sins and believe in God's gospel promise, that he grants us forgiveness of sins and eternal life by grace because of Christ's one sacrifice on the cross, then I can assure you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the authority of his word that your sins are forgiven you and you are not under the condemnation of God. How we need to hear that word from his throne of grace, that assurance from our God. And what can we do in response to such a great salvation but sing to his glory? And so let's sing together the doxology. I leave time for silent confession? I didn't. It's not because I don't have any sins. Somebody asked me that one time. If we go long, is it because you have a lot to confess? And if we forget it, it's just boys and girls because I can be forgetful. Um, so I'm sorry I didn't leave you time to confess your own personal sins. Um, but let's confess our faith now using the words of the Apostles' Creed, a faithful creed of the Christian church. And the celebration of the promises of the gospel summarized for us here. So Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's go before our God now in a time of congregational prayer together. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to come before your presence and to acknowledge that you are the great God who made the heavens and the earth, that you create us, you preserve us, you feed us, you sustain us and all of our children, and you are still willing to keep and govern us. And we thank you especially not only that you've given us to know you as creator, but also as redeemer through your son, Jesus Christ, and that you have pardoned our sins for the sake of his bitter passion and death. And so we can come before you with great thanksgiving, recognizing who you are. You've revealed yourself to us by your spirit. So we come before you as a faithful father, knowing your great love for us that has 
never begun because it's been an everlasting love. And in that great assurance of your love, it encourages us to come before your presence and to offer all of our prayers, all the things that we need for body and soul. We thank you for this great privilege, Father. Sometimes we can be so earnest to pray for the things that we need and so desperate in circumstances that drive us to you, we forget what a privilege it is to have a Father who hears, who loves to hear from us when we pray and will not fail to grant us anything that we ask for according to your will. And the only things that you hold back from us in prayers are things that would not ultimately be good for us. And so as we pray, Lord, would you fill our minds and hearts with that desire to do nothing according, except according to your will, that you would do all things according to your will and help us to accept that will without any back talk. But despite the fact knowing that you are sovereign and that you will do all things well, you still invite us to pray. You command us to pray. You desire for us to pray for the things that we need. And so we come before you with all of our prayers. And we do pray, Father, that you would renew us in the image of your Son, that you would use the means of grace to work powerfully in us to create faith in those who do not believe and to confirm and strengthen faith in your people. We thank you for these merciful gifts that you have given to us. We pray for the preaching of the word wherever it goes forth in the world, particularly as we think of our brother, Reverend Cortez, uh, setting out uh, in his first deployment with his ship. Lord, we pray your blessings upon his ministry that he will go to sea and be the chaplain for some 300 sailors. And so we pray, Lord, that you would bless him with a spirit of wisdom, that you would give him strength for his labors, that you would make his ministry profitable, um, that he would have a profound influence on those who serve our country. We're thankful for their service. We pray that you would keep them all safe. You would watch over all those, indeed, who serve our country, particularly those who are called by your name. So bless them and bless him. Bless his family as as he is away. Watch over them and keep them and help us to be uh, mindful of them while our brother is gone. And we're thankful, Lord, for the ministry that this church has extended throughout the world. We're thankful for Reverend Ferrari and his work in Italy and how we can be a part of that. For Reverend Korcha and his work in Romania. To be part of all of these various works, Lord, we are very thankful uh, to know that we have some small part to play in the gospel going forth in the world And in our corner of the world, we pray that you would continue to bless our our witness. We we preach for a little bit on Sunday, and then we go out to live in the world. We pray that you would extend our witness into the world through this congregation, that you would form us by your love, that you would help us to be salt and light in the world, uh, that people would see our lives and see the hope that we have and might be moved to ask the reason for the hope that we have and that you would give us words with gentleness and respect to talk to them about the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ and what you've done for our souls through him. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help us to have a profound effect as we not only speak to the world, but as we seek to love the world. Uh, Might they see how we love one another um, and be moved to give praise to you for all of those good things. We do pray that you would continue to build your church and watch over her, We know that many of our brothers and sisters throughout the world suffer many things at the hands of those who hate your son and hate his gospel, and we pray that you would preserve them, that you would keep them in the midst of difficult times, uh, that you would watch over them, that wherever the malice of Satan is at work, you would defend your people, uh, lest he pluck your holy word out of our hearts as he did to our first parents, Adam and Eve, and that you would tear down his strongholds and continue to advance the cause of the gospel in this world. We know, Lord, that we are particularly privileged as your people to live in a place where we can worship freely, uh, to live in a nation that thus far has not interfered with our ability to worship your name. And so we give you great thanks for that, that we don't have to gather today in fear of what the government might do. And we pray that you would continue to preserve our government so that we could continue to live quiet and peaceable lives serving you. We pray that you would give wisdom to those who govern us and that they would have a restraining fear of you, that you would keep them mindful that they are but your servants and ultimately will have to give an account to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords for how they use the power that they were given. We thank you for the privilege as citizens of this country to be involved 
in the decisions that are made by our uh, voting and by our participation. And so, Lord, we thank you for these gifts and recognize them as coming from your hand. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those who are uh, facing difficulty in our church, who are continuing to suffer. We know that there are many who are poor and who are sick. We have widows and widowers and orphans who need you. We pray that you would be with them all. We would watch over all troubled and tempted souls, that you would be with those who are in prison. And our hearts even go out to those, Lord, who are under discipline, that you would call them back to yourself. Grant them all your peace through our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his ensured promise. Truly, truly, I say to you, all things that you ask shall ask the Father in my name, he will give you. And so, Father, we pray with confidence and ask you to hear all of our prayers and hear us as we conclude with the prayer our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now have the opportunity to worship God with our gifts and offerings. The offering this morning is for the general fund. Take up our psalters once again, and as a song of preparation, turn to number 336, so sacred head now wounded. When the music begins, we'll stand and sing all the verses of number 336.
we open God's word, let's ask him to bless it to us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we open your word together, we ask that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that we may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of you. Strengthen us with all power according to Christ's glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. And hear our prayers, for we ask them in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please be seated. And please turn with me in God's word to the book of Mark, chapter 8. Mark, chapter 8. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you here this morning. We've been considering a series through the book of Mark, and we've come to Mark, chapter 8, verse 31. If you're using the Pew Bible, and many of our Pew Bibles, that's on page 1074. Mark is the second book of the New Testament between Matthew and Luke. And so Mark chapter 8, we're just going to read three verses and consider those verses together this morning. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. And Jesus begins to teach his disciples about his death and resurrection in this passage. So let us pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. And be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciple, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Thus far, the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. Well, this comes right on the heels of Peter's great confession on behalf of the disciples in verse 30, you are the Christ. And we said last time in looking at that verse that that forms something of a structural center in the gospel of Mark. That confession marks a real turning point in the gospel. Everything before that confession has really been flowing into that confession, and that confession will really shape everything that comes now in the gospel as the teaching of the gospel really turns in an important way towards what the Messiah has come to do. Um, one, one of the things that Jesus is going to teach a lot about in, this, in the coming chapters is about what the Messiah has come to do and what it means to follow the Messiah. Those are going to be the great themes that will continue through the book of Mark. And Mark begins that purpose here as Jesus begins to teach his disciples what it means that he is the Christ. What it means that the Christ has come into the world to do. And it's going to be a very different thing from what they were expecting. This is really about what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah. And in this text, we really see Christ's mission revealed. He teaches his disciples what he has come to do. And then we see Christ's purpose rebuked by Peter. And finally, Christ's priorities are proclaimed again by him in light of what Peter has said. And that's how we want to think about this text this morning. Christ's mission revealed, Christ's purpose rebuked, and Christ's priorities proclaimed. Uh, That's what we see going on in this text. Something new and remarkable is happening here in the teaching of Jesus Christ. He's teaching his disciples. And before we think about what he says, notice what Mark says about how he teaches. There's something different in how Jesus teaches here than how he's taught in the past. We read at the beginning of verse 32, and he said this plainly. Um, He said this plainly. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that Jesus was not being plain before or that his teaching somehow was bad before and now it's become good? Uh, No, what had Mark said before about the way Jesus taught? Uh, In chapter 4, we read that he taught many things in parables, that he used those kinds of story narratives or figures of speech to teach what he was talking about. And you remember that often it caused the disciples to come to him and say, we don't really understand that figure of speech. You talked about a sower and you talked about soils and you talked about a path. We don't know what you're talking about. And Jesus would have to explain the figure of speech to them. And what Mark is saying here is there's no teaching by way of parable here. 
There's no teaching by way of story narratives or any kind of allegory or any kind of figure of speech. Jesus is speaking to them plainly about who he is and what he's come to do. And so this is all being very clearly and plainly taught to them. That's how he teaches them. And so what does he teach them so plainly? What does he teach them so clearly? Well, first he teaches them something about his identity. Um, Peter has confessed, you are the Christ. Um, but he has told the disciples not to tell anyone this. And I think it becomes apparent as this text goes on why they were not to tell anyone this, because they really didn't understand it. Notice that Jesus begins his teaching plainly, not by using the title that Peter has applied to him, but using the title that he has applied to himself over and over again in this gospel. Um, he calls himself not the Christ here, but the Son of Man. The Son of Man has come. Uh, when we encountered this title before, it was in connection with his authority. When the Pharisees said, when he had said he was going to forgive the sins of the paralytic man, the Pharisees said in their hearts, who is this who thinks he has the authority to forgive sins? And Jesus says, I'll tell you exactly who I am. I'm the Son of Man. And that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I'll, hear the, I'll heal the paralytic and prove it. He is the Son of Man. It's a title of authority. He uses that title again in chapter 2 when he's talking about the Sabbath conflict with the Pharisees. And he says the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath. And we notice that, 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 noted at that time that that's a great title. It's a title of messianic power. And Jesus seems to have liked this title because it had all of the messianic clarity without any of the messianic confusion that was rampant in his day. Other messianic titles like the Messiah, like the Christ, like the Son of David, carried so many earthly and political associations for the people of God that they became confusing about what Messiah had come to do. They thought of him principally as an earthly ruler who would drive out their Roman overlords. That's sort of how they'd begun to think of him. And that's not the association Jesus wants people to draw. And so he uses another messianic title that's not caught up with all of those nationalistic hopes, but is a great title of glory from the Old Testament. Um, and what was that glorious picture? It was what Daniel saw in chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. And Jesus is once again proclaiming his identity to the disciples. Nothing has changed. He is still the one he claimed to be before. He is still the one that's been given all authority by his Father, has been given a kingdom, a kingdom that is eternal, that cannot be destroyed, a dominion that is forever. All of those things are still true. This is who Jesus is. And they need to understand his identity when they hear about the activity that the Son of Man has come to do. Because it would have run counter to everything they thought about the Christ and about the Messiah and what he would do. After reasserting his identity as the Son of Man who's been given a kingdom that can never be destroyed, he talks about what will happen, what he's come to do, that he will suffer many things, and that he will be rejected by the authorities. The three kinds of officers he mentions here were all part of the, the Jewish Sanhedrin, the leaders of the Jewish people. And so it's his way of saying, the leaders of the people of God will reject me. Um, he will suffer many things, he will be rejected by the authorities, and he will be killed. Um, this implies a violent death. He will be killed. But after three days, he will rise from the dead. 
despite being this great and glorious person, this is the activity that he has come to do in the world. He's come to suffer humiliation and then through that humiliation to be brought to glory. That's the mission that he is on in the world. And the teaching, so the teaching is about his identity and then about clearly about his activity. And then he wants his disciples to understand the necessity of it. That all these things that are going to happen need to happen. That's part of the plainness of his teaching to them. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise. The Son of Man must suffer. It is necessary that he suffers and is rejected before he enters into his glory. Um, it's necessary to happen. Why is it necessary? The first reason it's necessary is because Jesus has come to serve his Father. Jesus has come to fulfill the plan of salvation that the triune God had made before the foundation of the world. How he was going to save his people. And in obedience to the Father, Jesus has come into the world to save the people his Father has given him. Those who are loved by the Father, those who are loved by Jesus. That's his mission in the world. And the plan involves the suffering, the rejection, the humiliation, the death of the servant of the Lord. This has been prophesied in the Old Testament. Um, many of us are familiar with Isaiah 53. It's all there. The suffering, the rejection, the violent death. It's all there in Isaiah 53, 3 through 9. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. This was the plan of the Lord, that he, be, that he suffer many things, that he be rejected, that he meet a violent death. But it was also God's plan through this death to bring his servant through humiliation to glory. The suffering and the rejection and the death are all there in Isaiah 53, but also there is the resurrection. The whole section begins with this wonderful statement in Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted. Right? One person commenting on this passage said, Christ died for our sins is no gospel without a resurrection. Without a resurrection, it's just a sad story. It's just a tragic tale. And as tragic as those verses of Isaiah are, he didn't end with verse 9. He went on to say in verses 10 through 12, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring." He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death 
and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. You see, there is Good Friday and Easter in that passage. There is death and resurrection there. There's cross and crown there. There's grave and glory there. Have I made my point? Um, It's all there, isn't it? The plan of salvation that the Father has worked out with the Son by the Spirit throughout all, now coming into fruition in history. Jesus needs his disciples to understand this is necessary. It's even necessary that it happens after three days he will rise. That too was prophesied in the Old Testament, that the death will not be long. Uh, The glory will be what prevails in the end. Prophet Hosea, speaking for all of the people and not knowing that he maybe that he was speaking for the true Israel of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, says in Hosea 6, 1 and 2, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Jesus is teaching his disciples before it happens. This has been the plan. This is the plan that the Father put in. I'm serving my Father by doing these things. And not only am I serving my Father, I'm saving my people. That's why this is necessary. It's necessary for our salvation. The Son of Man has come to suffer these things and to die, not because of something he's done. By the time we get here in Mark's gospel, we've seen all the good that Jesus has done. All the blessedness he has brought to people around him. So when he suffers and is rejected and dies, it's not because of something he's done. It's because of something we've done. As Isaiah makes very clear, he's being crushed for our iniquities. He's being pierced for our transgressions. It's not just necessary because this was God's plan. It's necessary because this was God's plan to save sinners. That Jesus saves sinners and brings to us not only through his suffering and death a payment for our sins, but by his rising from the grave, victory and vindication over our sins. Christ died for our sins is no gospel because if he doesn't come forth for the grave, how could we know that our sins are paid for? If he went down for our sins and never came up, what would that message tell us? There has not been a sacrifice for sins. But when he goes down into the grave and comes out again and went down for our sins, for whom is he coming out of the grave? He's coming out of the grave for you and for me, for all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. His resurrection is proof that our sins have been paid for. I love how Thomas Chalmers puts it. You know that when the prison door is open to a criminal, and that by the very authority which imprisoned him, it shows that the debt of his crime has been rendered and that he stands acquitted of all its penalties. It was not for his own, but for our offenses that Jesus was delivered unto death and that his body was consigned to the imprisonment of the grave. And when an angel descended from heaven and rolled back the great stone from the door of the tomb, this speaks to us that the justice of God is satisfied, that the ransom of our iniquity has been paid, that Christ has rendered a full discharge of all the debt for which he undertook as this great surety between God and the sinners who believe in him. It's a wonderful way of thinking about it, isn't it? Who are angels? They are messengers of God. When the angels rolled the stone away, they were acting for God. God was rolling the stone away. God raised up his son. Why? Because the debt had been paid. Uh, There was no longer any debt owed It was to show that the debt had been cleared. That's why when Paul wants to summarize the wonderful promises of the gospel, he says in Romans 4.25, Jesus our Lord was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. 
He died to pay for our sins. He rose to prove that our sins had been triumphed over in him. Through suffering and death to bring victory and vindication to his people. Do you see why Jesus wants his disciples to understand this? Before it happens to understand all of this, that it's necessary for this to happen. It's part of God's plan. It's part of God's plan for salvation. He's doing these things to fulfill the mission. It's not because the plan has gone wrong. This has always been the plan the prophets spoke about. This is the mission of Jesus clearly revealed to his disciples. And Christ's purpose is then severely rebuked by Peter. So after he reveals his mission clearly, what does Peter come and do? He rebukes him. We see Christ's purpose rebuked by Jesus, or by Peter. He cannot accept this. And so he takes Peter, he, Peter takes Jesus aside to rebuke him. That's a very strong word. So far in the gospel, what, who's been rebuked? Jesus has been rebuking evil spirits. Um, we can't miss the strength of what Peter takes Jesus aside to do. He utterly rejects what the Lord has said. I like how J.C. Ryle characterizes this rebuke. Peter thought he knew what was right and fitting for his master better than his master himself and actually undertook to show the Messiah a more excellent way. Now certainly it has to be love for Christ that motivates Peter here. There are good intentions in Peter's heart for doing what he's doing. Peter's confession that he's the Christ is still so fresh. It should still be ringing in our ears as we read this passage. It's not a lack of love or a lack of faith that drives Peter. But as one commentator observed, alongside his faith, there is profound misunderstanding. For Peter, a Messiah that is humiliated and rejected and killed is incompatible with with the messianic hopes he has. Messiah is supposed to be a victor, not a loser. He's supposed to overcome, not succumb. I think part of what must be driving Peter is to say, I've seen what you can do. I've seen you command demons. I've seen you heal diseases. I've seen you raise the dead. I've seen you tell storms to be calm and everything obeys you when you call. How can someone reject you and kill you? Unless you choose not to show forth your power. Jesus, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you show forth your power? If they reject you, make them crawl. If they come to kill you, destroy them. Where is your power and authority if you let this happen? You can see what's motivating his rebuke and the kinds of things that he might have thought. And our inclination is always to say, poor dumb Peter. Right? Do you feel that way about Peter? Poor dumb Peter. He's always saying, the wrong thing. And there's an attitude we can bring to that that we act as if we would not have made the same mistakes that Peter made. We would have known better than to say something so dumb to our Lord. But don't we demonstrate all the time that we think we have a better way than God in the way we think about what he's doing? Do we ever think, why do I have to struggle with sin? I have these sins I struggle with, these sins I fight against, and I can't seem to get past them. Why doesn't God do do something about them when I pray? Why doesn't he intervene? Why do I suffer the sicknesses or the diseases that I suffer? Why am I so consumed with grief? Doesn't he have the power to take these things away? Why does he let me suffer? 
we have this wonderful gospel and we seek for it to go in the world. And when we tell people, they shrug it off and they ignore us. They think that's nice for you, but I really have no interest. And we, we feel every bit of the weakness of the preaching of the word. We sometimes can think, why don't you send angels that will stupefy people by their glory? Or why do you send men of clay feet who forget parts of the liturgy to try to do the work that you're to do? Why don't you just speak with your voice? Right? My voice doesn't melt the earth. His voice can melt the earth. Why doesn't he just speak directly? Every time we ask questions like this, We are offering to God the same thing that Peter offered to him. Counseling God about how he ought to run things better. Or like Job coming to God in our circumstances and saying, we are owed an explanation about how this makes sense. And when we're tempted to think like this, and we're tempted to follow these kind of courses of thought, I hope that this scene of Jesus speaking to Peter will be burned into our minds. This scene of how Jesus rounds on Peter and what he says to him. Because I think in his rebuke to Peter, he rebukes all of our similar thoughts and reminds us who alone knows the truth. Reminds us that at our best, we still look at things as mortal, fallen, fallible creatures and don't see things as the immortal, holy, and infallible God does. And that's why Christ rebukes Peter the way he does and proclaims his priorities. That's the last thing we see here is Christ's priorities then proclaimed. Peter has taken Jesus aside to rebuke him privately But now Jesus rebukes Peter publicly before all of the disciples. I think, again, because Peter functions as the spokesman for the disciples. And so just as in his confession, we can kind of see this being the confession of all the disciples. So in Peter's rebuke of Jesus, we can see this as the rebuke of all the disciples. And that's why he publicly rebukes Peter, seeing his disciples in view of them. He utters this rebuke. And it's as serious a rebuke as Jesus ever makes. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus is saying that in Peter's misguided, even if it's a well-intentioned rebuke, lurks the persistent temptation of the adversary. That's what Satan means, the adversary. Right? And how is Peter like the adversary here? Right? Peter is not Satan. So what does Jesus mean when he compares Peter to Satan here? Well, do you remember how the the adversary tempted the Lord in the wilderness? In Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, we read, And again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. What was the nature of that temptation? The nature of the temptation was this. The devil said to our Lord, you know, your father is offering you all the kingdoms of the world. And your father is offering you glory, but not without a grave. He's holding out to you a crown, but not without a cross. That exaltation will only come for your father through humiliation. And the devil says, let me show you a more excellent way. Because what I'll give you is a crown without a cross. I'll give you glory without a grave. No, I don't ask for any suffering. I don't ask for any rejection. I don't ask for a violent death. All I'm asking is that you bow down and worship me. That's easier than an eternity of hell for sinners. That's the nature of the temptation. And what does Jesus do? He responds, be gone, Satan. 
for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. In the Greek, there's really only one variation and one word added between what Jesus had said to the devil and what Jesus says to Peter. He said to the devil, depart from me. He says to Peter, depart behind me. But it's a similar rejection. And I think it's a similar rebuke and rejection because Peter's temptation is similar. Peter is urging the Lord not to go the way of glory that goes through suffering, that goes through the grave, not to go the way of a crown that requires a cross. And Jesus is still as determined to reject that. And for Peter to understand, you're seeing things as man sees them, not as God sees them. You see this as giving up. You see this as losing. That's not what's happening here. And Peter is learning a lesson that is so important for all of us. That our fundamental problem as fallen, finite, fallible people is that from our human perspective, we often cannot grasp God's divine purposes. And in our limited minds, we think that because things don't make sense to us, they don't make sense at all. And what Jesus is doing is helping us to see just because it doesn't make sense to you does not mean that it doesn't make sense. Because you can't think the way God thinks. And you can't see things the way God sees them. What is the wonderful testimony of Isaiah 55, 8 and 9? For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Right? What did Peter think he was doing? He sincerely thought he was offering Jesus a better way. But we know what would have happened if Jesus had done as Peter counseled. He would have consigned all humanity throughout history to eternal condemnation and hell forever. That's how failed our thoughts are on things. And the glory of our Savior is revealed in his relentless commitment to the purposes and priorities of the things of God. And he's committed to it even though he knows where it will lead him. That it will lead him down a dark and horrible road to the cross of Calvary and to hell and to the grave. But he also knew that it would lead up from the grave to an eternity of glory at the right hand of the Father he loved and he, who he wanted nothing more to serve faithfully. And more than that, Jesus knew that by walking that dark and horrible road for us, he would save us from ever having to walk such a road ourselves. Because all those who believe in him avoid eternal suffering and eternal rejection and eternal death because Christ has endured those things for us. And we receive vindication and victory because he rose from the dead triumphant over the grave and our sins that put him there. Praise the Lord that Jesus would not be diverted from his course. Praise the Lord that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost and that he lived a perfect life in obedience to his Father and he died a sacrificial death and he rose triumphant, glorious from the grave. He has done it. Praise his name forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we confess that we often make the same mistakes Peter made, that you teach us things plainly in your word, and when we find ourselves unable to make sense of them, then we somehow think we know better how to do things than you do. We pray that you would forgive us for this sin, that we would always remember that your ways are not our ways, that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. As far as the heavens are above the earth, your thoughts are higher than ours. And so 
we pray that we would be reminded that your plans are better. And when we think that we have a better way, as Peter thought he had a better way, uh, often our ways would lead to ruin. And we thank you for our Lord. We thank you for his devotion to you. We thank you for his devotion to us, that he was willing to suffer and die for sinners, and that he is risen triumphant over the grave to assure us that our sins have been paid for and that we have been set free from misery and death. We thank you for our Savior. We thank you for his plain teaching. We thank you for his work. And we thank you that his spirit continues to proclaim the great good news of Jesus our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. We praise his name forever. Hear us, we, praise, we pray in his name. Amen. We'll remain seated. Singing, Oh, the Deep Unbounded. just as Isaiah 53 has Good Friday and Easter in it, so also Psalm 22 has Good Friday and Easter in it. So we want to sing as our song of response number 22C, setting of a portion of Psalm 22 amid the thronging worshipers. When the music starts, we'll stand and sing all the verses of 22C.
beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, lift up your hearts now to the Lord and receive his blessing. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. People of God, go in peace. Thank you.